Thank you all so much for coming this afternoon. I don't know about you, it's been a, a really wonderful week just to see people again and, and get that face-to-face -face contact. So we're just thrilled that you've been able to, to spend this afternoon um, in the session with us on investing in positive outcomes through a human rights approach and stakeholder engagement. Uh, my name is Kendra Moore. I'm a business and human rights attorney with BSR, or Business for Social Responsibility. And BSR is a nonprofit business association, a network of companies. We've been around for about 30 years. And the goal, what we do on a day-to-day -day basis is to support companies across industries to really amplify their efforts to respect human rights and the environment and to create a more sustainable and just future for all of us. So I'm really excited today to have this conversation at a very critical point in our economic journey here as a country and in the world, um, and to be uh, joined by my very esteemed colleagues, Kate Finn from First Peoples Worldwide, and Mary Beth Gallagher from Domini Impact Investments to talk about this critical issue of human rights and stakeholder engagement. And we hope that at the end of the session today to really leave you with three key takeaways. First, a deeper understanding of what a human rights approach looks like in the impact space, the role of stakeholder engagement in that approach, and lastly, just some tools and lessons that we've seen in our own experiences and leave those with you uh, regardless of where you are in the impact ecosystem. And before we get started, we have a poll that we wanted to uh, share with you all. If you have the app on a tablet or your phone, you'll click on the polls tab there. And we have two questions just to understand where you all are coming from and your exposure and your work with human rights in your day-to-day -day operations in your organization. So please feel free to, to submit those answers for us as we get started. I'll, I'll wait for just a, a few seconds um, to see those results come through. All right. Looks like we have a, a good mix here from civil society to asset managers and allocators and some service providers. And on the second question, which is how much work you do on a day-to-day -day basis or your exposure to human rights issues, risks and impacts, and a few of you are familiar with that, have, have exposure to that. So that's great to know, to anchor our conversation in those details. And so it, it's probably not much of a surprise for you in the audience to know that when you think of human rights and respect for human rights, the financial services industry is really far behind compared to other industries, even like mining or textiles. So I learned this firsthand working directly with communities and advocating for their rights after they had been harmed by negative impacts and investments in those outcomes. And this happened in project finance and impact investing, but I've seen it across asset classes where harm can occur, even in the best of circumstances and with the best intentions. And while at BSR, we're really working with companies from asset owners, to asset managers, investees, portfolio companies, to help them ground their approaches and build out tools for them to understand a human rights landscape and what it means to respect and advance the rights of people that they're impacting through their operations and their value chains. So maybe one of the first questions we should really ask and try to answer with the audience is, what are human rights? I actually just talked with a few people this morning about that, um, two investors who are asking, you know, it means so many different things to different people. You know, where do you even start? And I said to them, it's really about the inherent, what's inherent to being human. It's about dignity. And if you think back to modern, you know, human rights standards, international standards that we have today, they're pretty much grounded for centuries, but coming out of the Second World War, where governments agreed to international standards to respect human rights. So it covers things like the right to privacy, the right to health care, 
the right to education, the right to have a family or not have a family, freedom of association, indigenous people's rights. So it covers a wide range of things. And from the ESG lens, if, if, you're, if you're in that space as well, it's woven throughout the E, the S, and the G pillars. Uh, so it's not just a single thing or a single point in time. It's, it's really grounded in the outcomes and impacts on people in their day-to-day -day lives and their rights and grounded in human dignity. So we start with that and, and think through, okay, so we understand a little bit more about what human rights are, but what does that mean to me? Like, okay, human rights are important. What does that mean for investors and finance in general? Why is it, why is it important? And you'll hear a lot of the common reasons, of course, the moral reasons um, that I think are probably very familiar with the SoCal crowd, but also the regulatory risks if you're exposed to, say, European markets where there's a lot of regulatory developments around human rights due diligence, mandatory disclosures, things of that sort. So depending on the industries you're investing in or your investment vehicles, what your exposure is, those could be very meaningful for you. Also, the financial risk if something goes wrong. You have that, you have legal risk, reputational risk. So a lot of exposure talking more about risk, risk, risk. There's also a lot more attention from media and civil society on human rights impacts, including from investors who are asking questions, getting questions from their shareholders to take action, pay more attention to human rights. I feel like, though, those are all great reasons and very valid, but at the same time for impact investors and in this space, the human rights approach is absolutely critical. It's not just about risk mitigation. And it's not just about reputation, but it's about maximizing positive outcomes of each investment and really empowering people and communities to drive lasting change on their own terms, by their own design. So the human rights approach provides us with tools and a framework to really look at finance differently, to see it as an avenue or a means to advance respect for human rights and for dignity for all. And the framework that we use as practitioners in the human rights space is the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights. Some of you may have heard of it. It's the, the UNGPs for short. And they were widely passed by governments back in 2011. I mean, that was a long time ago, <laughs> if you think before, before the pandemic days. Um, and it slowly got in traction, the UNGPs, in the financial space. Um, and, you know, much more so in, in, I, in the, the impact space, because I think the terminology and some of the, the approaches for impact investors are, are a little more aligned um, than in other asset classes. But that said, the UNGPs are enormously, enormously useful. They provide a framework and a lens and lay out the expectations for all businesses, all businesses across every sector, and how they're supposed to respect human rights. For instance, through a policy commitment, human rights due diligence, monitoring, evaluation, disclosure, making sure that you're transparent about your human rights impacts, what you're doing about them, and what your actual, what, how you're addressing those through stakeholder engagement. So a cornerstone of the UNGPs in respecting human rights is truly meaningful stakeholder engagement, getting those voices, even critical voices, at the table to learn not only what could go wrong and how to prevent harm, but to really hear how you can facilitate and amplify those voices and turn it into positive, lasting change. So turning to my colleagues, first Mary Beth, I'd love to hear from you a little bit about how, from an investor perspective, you see the human rights approach. What does that look like in practice? And tell us about stakeholder engagement, what that, what that, how that connects to your human rights approach at Domini. Um, thanks, Kendra, and thanks so much, everyone, for being here. Um, it's great to have the opportunity to share a little bit about Domini's work, and I'll start by saying 
um, we're learning and doing this work in collaboration and together. So I think um, while I'll, sh I'll share what we're doing, there's like so much room for um, us to continue to grow and strengthen our work. Um, but just to start, Domini is a mutual fund, so we invest in publicly traded companies and fixed income investments. And um, we recognize that corporations are um, inherently connected to a lot of impacts on communities and stakeholders. There are some sectors of corporations that are fundamentally misaligned with the human rights-based approach. Um, and Domini thinks about all of that as we build our portfolios. So we align our investments with our standards that look at universal human dignity and ecological sustainability. And it starts with sort of deciding which companies are eligible for investment. And we look first at a company's business model. How do you make your money? Um, are you building something that's good for society? Are you building something that everyone has access to without discrimination, that serves a public good? And then how do you treat your stakeholders? So when we think about stakeholders at Domini, we're looking at a company's employees, its customers, its supply chain partners, um, its community stakeholders, its investors, and all of those institutions and individuals that a company impacts. And we put that into our investment uh, analysis process. And part of what the way we look at stakeholder engagement is where we get our data. So we're looking at like company disclosures, but also thinking about community stakeholders who may be connected to companies and have insights that are important for our evaluation. And then we think about um, what is our role and our responsibility once we're an investor in a company. And that's where my role as director of engagement comes in, really thinking about um, how we can engage with companies when we identify a problem or an area where they need to improve their practices. For example, um, if they're not allowing workers to organize, they have anti-union tactics, we might engage on freedom of association or collective bargaining. Or if communities have concerns around um, increased investment in fossil fuels, when a company has made a commitment to the low carbon transi transition, we might encourage them to adopt a stronger climate policy and then engage with them about it. So we are trying to learn from stakeholders around how a company is impacting communities and then use our voice as share owners through investor dialogues with corporate executives, through attending shareholder meetings, through filing shareholder proposals, using this array of tools to try to hold companies um, either to account or to improve. Uh, so that's just a little bit about how we think about stakeholders and incorporate, it into our, incorporate them into our work. And I'll just say, fundamentally, we're starting with a premise that a lot of stakeholders don't trust investors, don't trust companies. So we have to really think about it from what's in it for me. I've just said, like, we've learned a lot and improves our process, but also what's in it for them um, and how can we use our voice and leverage in a way that adds value and helps those community partners, stakeholders, rights holders to advance their own agenda. So really balancing um, that mutuality and relationship is key. Absolutely, relationship is key. And I'm wondering, Kate, from your perspective, working with indigenous communities and, and seeing the impacts of investments on the ground, what does meaningful stakeholder engagement really look like in practice? What, and why is it important to those communities? Absolutely, and thank you for the question. And thank you so much for the opportunity to be here today and to speak to you all. Um, my name is Kate Finn. I'm the director of First Peoples Worldwide. Uh, our mission is to work from a foundation of indigenous values to achieve a sustainable future for all. And what we do day to day as an organization is build bridges between indigenous peoples and the private sector. So, so to get to your question, Kendra, why, why, why is meaningful engagement important? What does it look like? Uh, for indigenous communities, for this constituency that I work with, um, meaningful engagement looks like FPIC. It looks like free, prior, and informed consent. And that can be done in so, so many different ways. But I want to just take just a tiny moment while I have the mic to do a little bit of history, like why, why stakeholder engagement? Why is this a thing? Why, why do we need it? And why is it important? And why is it actually critical when you think about the way that you move your money through your portfolio? So 
For indigenous peoples in particular in the United States, indigenous peoples have been um, subject to waves of racist and assimilationist policies throughout time, uh, since before the treaties. So we know that there was, in the 1800s, it was the policy of the United States to remove indigenous peoples from their land, land dispossession, uh, resource dispossession, and like to physically move tribes away. And one scholar has called that a measured separatism. It was intentional. It was an intentional invisibilizing. But where that is today, and then that was continued throughout policy, right? So then tribes were over here somewhere where people didn't see them. But then the government decided that people from tribes should be dispossessed of each other, that people should move to big cities. And there was uh, policies around termination of tribes. And there was the boarding school era where children were taken away from their families. So there's been intentional policy, intentional um, legal structures towards indigenous peoples that have removed them and invisibilized us. And here's the thing that we still live with today is this economic invisibility. What we work with every single day is not that native entrepreneurs, native people and native organizations aren't coming up with real time solutions because they are. It's the invisibility that persists. It's the economic invisibility and that um, idea that, that people are over here on the sidelines. And my work every single day is to work with native entrepreneurs, native organizations, tribes and tribal enterprises who are on the ground doing the real thing. When you want data, when you talk about data and data on indigenous peoples, there are tribes who have that. There is um, you know, officers at every tribe that has data on how the climate is affecting their particular lands. So stakeholder engagement is the way to integrate that data, to operationalize that data, and to walk into a better relationship. And the reason that this is important is because I believe that investors have a role in operationalizing what engagement looks like and how it can look better. So of course, free prior and informed consent is a right that's written into the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples that was adopted in 2007. And free prior and informed consent is a right. It's also a process. It's a way to elevate indigenous leadership and to ensure that there's equity in decision making and equity in participation in any decision that impacts lands, territories, and resources. So not just the decisions that impact people negatively, although those are the ones we hear about most, but also the deal making, also the capital infusions, also the impact investments, right? It's the way to ensure that there is equity, that everyone is visible at the table, and to make sure that what is going forward is better and is actually aligned with human rights. And I really do believe that um, because of the history of policy in Indian country in the US, any investment into Indian country is an impact investment. And I think that a rights-aligned approach is the way to do it better, to do it differently, and to drive a continuum of, continuum of capital um, that is meaningful for everyone. That's great, Kate. No, well said, for sure. Um, and it's a, a key takeaway, I think, for, for all of us to remember, like, how can we really do it better um, in a system that is largely, largely broken in many ways? Um, and I'm wondering if we could maybe talk a little bit more about the collaboration between you two from different, from different angles. I know you both have worked on the Line 3 um, tr uh, pipeline project, pipeline replacement project. So what have you found as, as like key lessons from that collaboration in terms of respecting human rights? What, what's coming to the surface um, in this ongoing work that you're doing together? Yeah, so, so the work is ongoing, um, as, as always, but one of the things that we do at First Peoples Worldwide is move indigenous priorities to uh, investors who want to work through shareholder advocacy and who can use their, their power in shareholder advocacy to really move those priorities. So when we talk about Line 3, we're talking about a pipeline that was built uh, through Anishinaabe territory. Uh, and the pipeline was originally built in 1961 and put into operation in 1968. Um, it had numerous spills. And then in 2016, there was a dissent dec 
consent decree that the pipeline needed to be rebuilt. And the company, um, upon hearing that the pipeline needed to be rebuilt, uh, all of the communities in that area, in that watershed, uh, announced their opposition. They did not give their free prior and informed consent, and several tribes started uh, legal advocacy and legal cases to oppose that pipeline. Um, what I was able to do uh, with the support of tribal leaders is to bring this priority to shareholder advocates who actually signed a letter representing $2 trillion in assets uh, under management that we sent to banks uh, who are financing the company to say, uh, this is material, that uh, consent was not given, and in fact this pipeline is being built, and so Mary Beth um, moved that moved that engagement through. Yeah, so building on what Kate shared, um, so I think there it like speaks to sort of the process too. How did the issue come to investors? And that's part of what's important for us. We can have what we work on as well as how we work on it informed by stakeholders. So um, learning from the work of First Peoples and this investor letter, our responsibility then as shareholders in the banks that finance the pipeline replacement was to reach out to them and seek um, you know, more information. You're a company that has commitments to the equator principles. You're a company with a human rights policy. You're a company that has talked about the importance of indigenous leadership. Why did you finance a pipeline that communities vocally and consistently opposed prior to it moving forward? Um, so our role then as shareholders was to send this letter and then meet with the company executives. And I think an another learning from this process was that um, as shareholders, we approached those meetings with Kate at the table with us as an issue expert, as a representative of her partners um, who had closer connections to the pipeline. And it shifted the conversation completely to um, sort of like a process-oriented transactional um, conversation of you have a policy, we want to know like what happened, to um, really starting the conversation what FPIC means, what it, what FPIC done right looks like as a process. And, um, you know, we hold thousands of companies, we invest um, using the best available data that companies put out in their disclosure. And um, part of our role in shareholder advocacy and engagement is to understand you have a policy, how is it being implemented in practice? We see this divide, help us understand it. In the future, help us close that divide. Um, so really translating into conversations where you're in discourse with companies about what went wrong, trying to encourage them to learn from these experiences so that next time we're not repairing harm but um, acting in a way that's preventative. Um, so really like leaning on the expertise of Kate was our, our benefit. Hopefully by using investor leverage, we elevated the work that they're doing um, and trying to gain more um, action from companies, frankly, to do better next time and to incorporate into their due diligence processes, their corporate lending, their project finance, more um, rights-based and um, rights-aligned FPIC processes. And um, this is like a little bit in the weeds, but I think is part of what makes it different when you engage with stakeholders. So Kate described this FPIC process that's meaningful, that's um, relational. And a lot of companies talk about um, not consultation, or not consent, but consultation. Um, and there's a real difference in the outcomes when you're consulting with someone like, yes, we want to hear from you, but we're still going to make the decision that we were seeking to make. Whereas consent is an opt-in or opt-out, there's really um, a sovereignty and leadership by indigenous peoples in granting or not granting consent, whereas consultation, sort of a company can move forward um, regardless of what they've heard. And you know, we work on lots of different issues and that nuance is something that um, we might not notice if we didn't have stakeholder partners sort of helping us understand why, what that difference looks like in practice. It looks like a pipeline not being built that communities opposed as a, instead of a pipeline being built in the face of opposition. And so mm -hmm. when we talk about outcomes yeah. and expectations and really terms, there's so much that's embedded in um, in those terms that communities who have more at stake are thinking about when they hear consent, 
they mean consent, they don't mean consultation. And a company that's sort of going through a check the box exercise um, doesn't necessarily understand the, the um, gravity of those kinds of differences. Mm -hmm. I think that's a really good point, like actually getting through you know, that message of what consent really means and that meaningful stakeholder engagement, like those principles, what that looks like both from the community lens and, you know, the investor, the investees, and how they're approaching it. I know even at BSR, some of the tools that we use when we're working with investors um, and portfolio companies is really, you know, helping them identify in this universe of human rights impacts that could occur. Um, with the investment is, you know, okay, so we have this big lens, you know, helping them understand what the salient, most severe rights um, risks and impacts might be, and then directing their engagement, focusing their engagement to try to understand those risks and impacts and prevent them in a more meaningful way. So it isn't like, well, we have to engage everyone on everything. It's really much um, more strategic than that. And I think you get better information when you can concentrate your efforts in that way. And I'm wondering if you, if you both have um, other tools or strategies for investors or investees that you would recommend um, when they're thinking through, they're serious about this, they want to do it right, they want to be engaged with stakeholders. What, is, what are some tools that you have in mind that you might share? Sure, happy, happy to, to speak to that. So, um, you know, like I said, with, with indigenous communities, it's free prior and informed consent. That is the way to operationalize a good relationship. But it is taking the time to understand what does that mean for you? Where do you sit and what does that mean? You know, we have at First Peoples Worldwide a, a free prior and informed consent due diligence questionnaire that we give to companies that kind of walks through all of the steps that they need in order to understand their, their um, impacts, but also to understand their exposure to indigenous rights risk. And that is one way to start and to really walk through and think through. And I think the other thing too is to, uh, you know, think about when you're working with rights holders, when you're working with um, stakeholders, it's this issue that, that Mary Beth said so eloquently, you know, it's not just about getting to a yes. It's not just about moving forward with the project. It's about being ready to hear what it is the stakeholder community, what, it, what the rights holder community, what the tribe is saying, and being ready to operationalize and work what it is that they're saying into your process, and being ready to accept a no, or a conditional no, or a conditional yes, or a yes, or maybe we need this kind of capital, but not this kind of capital, or maybe your networking support, whatever that is. It's about being ready and designing your approach to the stakeholders that you touch in a way that allows that leadership and that information to flow forward. Yeah, I guess I'll start with the basics, like who do you partner with and how do you find them? Um, some of that just comes from like, reading the paper and like who's, um, it, who's writing a report about a company that we own shares in and what are their concerns. And then like following up with them, explaining our willingness and opening, openness to being a partner with them and having our strategy informed by them. Um, so just like outreach, who do, you, who do you partner with? How do you know that they um, understand uh, the issue? And I have an interest in sitting alongside an asset manager. Um, I think an openness to receiving information, just net, earlier today I was at the, the Domini booth um, and somebody came, approached us and um, pointed out a company that we highlight in our investment report and shared about um, their experience with that company and how it sort of conflicted with our, our description of why they were a good investment. And I think, you know, that's not ideal, um, but we are an investor that looks at all the information we have available to us and sort of balance the good and the bad. Like a lot of these companies are imperfect, um, but I think that a willingness to receive that information, then now that we know, like act on it. Okay, now I wanna ask this company about how they treat their workforce or follow up with this individual and see if they'll share more about their experience with that company so that we can constantly be in um, like a learning and reaction reaction mode um, and rather than defensive. Like I think um, 
we have to recognize that once we know something and once a partner has shared information with us, that sort of shifts us into an action um, mode. So being willing to sort of be led and be critiqued, I think is part of it, that's hard. Um, and then like understanding the tools that we have expertise in. So shareholder dialogue, um, writing a shareholder proposal and submitting that for a company's proxy statement, um, attending a shareholder meeting. These are tools that I know well and if I um, meet with a partner and say like this is, this is the, it, these are the tools we have. Are you trying to raise visibility or speak directly to the board? Are you trying to garner attention from a broad shareholder base? Let's write a letter. Um, sort of explaining the tools that we have and then seeing how a partner wants to use those tools to advance their objectives. Um, for sure, like doing that in collaboration and building um, a strategy together that helps us um, be credible actors and investors in a company. We can't sort of um, act at odds with our own fiduciary obligations, but also really thinking about willing to share the decision making on what goals we set. Um, and even as I referenced earlier that Kate joined these engagements with the banks around the financing, not every company is open to that. And part of what we need to do as partners is be clear on the terms and expectations. So we'll partner together. There are gonna be companies that won't let a community activist join the conversation. Does that mean we won't meet with them unless you're there? or just being really clear about expectations and what partnership looks like, when we're gonna be keeping you informed, when we're gonna be seeking your input, when um, you can drive the train and when we need to, and like, at least just being honest about the real meaningful limitations um, of the financial tools that we have available. I think that's a really good point. It's like looking at that toolbox, like seeing all the different avenues or, or tools you have to either use leverage uh, build collective action maybe with other investors or other companies, like-minded companies, or even from the civil society perspective, you know, joining forces together to, to pressure change in the right direction. And, and one thing that comes to mind is, you know, from what you were saying, Kate, it's, you know, getting that consent, which might be a conditional no, might be a conditional yes, but it's also, it's not only about like preventing harm down the road, but listening for those opportunities, because if it is a conditional no or yes, what could it mean if you're transforming that into a yes through this meaningful engagement and building those lasting relationships? How does that turn it into a much stronger impact case, a much better sustainable outcome for you and the investment side or the company that's delivering the product or the service as well as for the community. It's, it's a win, win, win. And I think from our perspective, it's always like, it's hard to see why no one else sees that or why you know we, this seems to be a, a newer approach in some circles um, and the challenge with bringing that on. I think it is, it is difficult. It is certainly a lot of work um, to engage. It's a choice to engage. Um, but in the impact space, it seems like it's, it's absolutely fundamental to getting to, to, from A to Z. Um, and I'm wondering, we have a, a few minutes left here, um, if either of you have some takeaways, key points you want to leave the audience with as we wrap up, key thoughts or, or messages you wanted to share. Um, I guess I'll, I can start. Um, just to say, for us, I think it's like we're opting into stakeholder engagement, which is a real position of privilege. I think I see the value in it. It's inherently um, something I'm inclined to want to do. But I think we're sitting in a position where we can sort of also not engage with stakeholders. And I think that's at great risk to the, the world we're trying to create through our investments. And um, partners need us to be willing and able to partner with them um, if we want to achieve the outcomes we're looking for. So. It feels like a nice sort of layer on or um, additionality, but I think really it's a fundamental responsibility in thinking about how we um, build more connections so that investors are better connected to stakeholders. We're often like so far away um, in working on so many companies, but when we're thinking about worker well-being and access to health and um, clean air and water, like people whose um, rights and 
opportunity to live a safe and healthy life are affected by companies need to have different venues to raise those concerns and we need to be sort of willing to work with them. And we know there are solutions that work designed by the very people who are most impacted. Worker-driven social responsibility models have changed the experience of farm workers in Immokalee, Florida, because they created a solution that addressed the problems that they face. And our willingness to learn from those solutions and then help them scale it where we have leverage, um, I think offers the most potential for us to drive meaningful outcomes. So um, I guess just an openness and an encouragement to see this as part of our um, obligation as impact investors. Mm. Excellent. How about you, Kate? So I think there's there's kind of two things that I would um, press on, and one is what Mary Beth said. It's it's we all have a role in this work together, and it's about defining the goal together and stepping into good relationship and being in the design of the solutions together, and also that the, you know the gravity of the situation falls differently. So, um, for example, one of the most successful uh, shareholder engagements that we've seen at First Peoples Worldwide was when we were able to, um, and it was an effort over 30 years, um, there was a lot of work when the Washington football team, you know, they changed their name to the Redskins in the late 1960s, which of course is a dictionary defined racist slur. Um, in the early 1970s, Native women really picked up and Native organizations picked up to tell the team, this is not okay, this is not okay. In the 1990s, we saw uh, legal advocacy in cases that actually went up to the Supreme Court to try and fight that name. And then in the early 2000s, uh, shareholder advocates came together and looked, and looked at the companies that surrounded the team, um, PepsiCo, Nike, and FedEx had the stadium, and started going to the AGM, started engaging, and it was through power sharing. It was through going in through these shareholder advocates um, for years and years and years. And then uh, in 2020, when the NFL said that they were committed to ending racism, uh, we once again renewed those calls uh, to the companies in, I believe the letter was sent on July 6th of 2020, and by July 13th, uh, the team had retired their racist name. So there's power. There's power in this work. But what it means for me, I'm so glad that the name was retired. I'm so glad that the advocacy of all of those people worked. But what it means for me is that over in this country, over 200 high schools have changed away from their, their racist mascots. 200 high schools have. Thank you. So to me, what that means is there are native kids all over the country that just get to play baseball and they just get to play basketball, and they get to live in dignity, and their identity is not at stake when they face opposing teams that do things like the, ch the tomahawk chop. So the gravity is real, and the opportunity is real. We can change how people are living their lives and how Native, um, Native kids and our future generations are going. So it, it means a lot. It means a lot to me. It means a lot to my children that we were able to do that. And there's so much more advocacy that's coming. And I think to the goal setting um, you know, priority that Mary Beth said, it really is about impact investors and those with capital designing their approach to stakeholder engagement. Not necessarily designing the solution or defining the solution, but designing how you will step in in a rights-based way uh, to really affect the lives of people uh, on the ground. That's great. Thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, we have just a few more moments and um, would love to take questions here. We have a few lined up. I'm just going to go in order. What metrics do you use in evaluating whether a company is meeting human rights goals and standards? Metrics. It always goes back to metrics. No, I think that's important. an important question. So first, we want a company to have a commitment. Like, do you have a policy to respect human rights that applies all across your business? Um, so that's the starting point. And then measuring their progress in fulfilling that. So it might look like um, how they address grievances. It might look like how they ensure that um, workers have a opportunity to thrive without freedom of, without harassment and discrimination in the workplace. It might look like 
um, creating products and services that meet the needs of vulnerable populations. So I think it's, it depends a bit on what a company's business model is. Um, in our research process, we have a really detailed evaluation of um, sort of within different segments, what rights respecting business operations look like. Um, but we need to see improved disclosure for sure, um, whether around human capital management or, or climate related financial disclosures to help us better evaluate company progress because we simply have too many data gaps. And that's why stakeholders are um, so important for sharing information about um, when a policy is out there that it's not being put into practice. Mm -hmm. um, so a little bit um, of a wishy-washy answer, but there's a lot we're looking to see and a lot of it is qualitative rather than quantitative. Other thoughts? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Mary Beth, this one's for you. I'm going to try to do rapid okay. fire here. So um, you have limited time and resources, as we all do. Um, how do you prioritize for the greatest potential for impact? Yeah, I think this is a really meaningful constraint is time. So like time is the reason we don't do stakeholder engagement for every single engagement we do um, because we couldn't be good partners that way. So really thinking about um, where there's exposure, whether it's the size of our investment in a company or the severity of, of a human rights impact, sort of the saliency framework that Kendra walked through. Um, some of it is opportunistic. When a war begins and we have exposure to that war through um, supply chains and the companies we invest in, that raises some responsibility. So we have some priorities around um, human rights and workplace, addressing systemic racism, addressing climate change, and work within that framework to think about priorities. Um, but I also have a certain segment of our workplace, our work plan that's emergent just based on sort of what we see um, coming through the research, coming through um, media monitoring, and through stakeholder inputs. Mm, excellent, okay. And here's a good one. Do you have any examples of successful stakeholder advocacy and how, two-part question, and how can stakeholders use these tools to pressure large public companies? I might just share one, one, one example of successful stakeholder advocacy um, in working with um, a number of, of civil society actors to push um, uh, development finance institutions to really take their investments in Haiti seriously, um, where there was a lot of pressure on a um, so-called impact investment project, um, an industrial port to revitalize the country um, after the earthquake. Unfortunately, there was very little due diligence done on the forefront, and a lot of people got displaced, lost their jobs, lost their livelihoods. Um, and there was a real moment where we were not only, you know, working with local groups on the ground, but international organizations all over from different, from foundations um, to the media to really amplify the issues that were happening on the ground. And again, even in the best of circumstances, with best intentions, until we finally got a mediated dialogue with the Inter-American Development Bank and USAID to sit down with the, the communities and provide them with restitution and a forward-looking path to restoring their livelihoods. Um, I don't know, do either of you have, have good examples of stakeholder adv advocacy? Absolutely. So I think, you know, the Washington football team uh, advocacy was over 30 years. Um, something that happened very quickly, relatively quickly. Uh, we work with the Gwich'in Steering Committee to protect the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. Their sacred lands uh, is in the coastal plain. Over uh, two years, we were able to work, and their, their mandate, their priority is no oil and gas drilling. That's what the Gwich'in Steering Committee wants. We worked with them for, over for two years, and we were able to secure um, commitments from 29 international banks not to finance oil and gas drilling in the coastal plain, and there are now 17 insurance companies that have agreed not to uh, release any insurance products related to development in the in the coastal plains. So not every tribe, not every indigenous issue is development, but it's certainly a big one. Um, and really that was because the Gwich'in Steering Committee, we were able to work with leadership to bring them to all of those meetings. They went all around the world. We've been all over in lots of different rooms and spaces to say what the coastal plain means and what it looks like. And so that has been very successful because it's um, protecting the space that's sacred to the Gwich'in. 
Um, sure, I think defining success in different ways I think is important because of that timeline. So we're not seeing like monumental corporate shifts overnight just because of the entrenched systems of oppression and inequality that are in, here and hard to shift. Um, so thinking about like increased visibility, a different platform, um, more partners, um, investors being better equipped to speak as advocates alongside partners. Um, so really like giving ourselves the space to grow into the outcomes that were the monumental shifts we're looking for and recognizing that um, partnership along the way that's trust building and relationship oriented is successful. So like I think the line three collaboration, while we haven't seen um, any of the 12 banks sort of shift overnight, we've deepened our own expertise, we've deepened the relationship. So next time we won't have to wait two years after the controversy to send the letter, we'll be there before it happens. And I think part of that is building readiness and appetite. So um, there are like other examples we can share for sure, but I really wanna focus on um, giving ourselves space to, to identify relationships as a success because they're not automatic and they take a lot of um, effort to develop and it's really meaningful when that helps enhance the quality and the outcomes of our work. Thank you both so much, and thank you, everyone. I'm sorry we didn't get to all the questions. Please catch us outside or, or at any other events if you want to talk further. There were some other really great questions in there, and really, really hope that we can transform the system and make it more rights-respecting. Um, I think we owe it uh, to the society that we live in and, and our environment to do so. So thank you all so much for coming. <laughs>